Well, we're uh, starting a new series today, and I thought I would begin it with um, a couple of things you may know, but things you need to be reminded of. Do you know that actions have consequences? If you stay up late at night, the next day you're going to be gr cranky, grumpy, and tired. If you fail to study for a test, you're going to either flunk it or get a bad grade. If you can't hit the ball, you lose to the stinking Mets. <laughs> and if you hit the ball, you beat the Mets. Actions have consequences. But this series is about beliefs have consequences too. Not just our actions, but what we believe does. So for example, if you believe that you're guaranteed of that promotion with a big pay increase, You'll overspend even before the first paycheck comes. If you believe that that growling, snarling dog is not going to bite you, you'll be getting a rabies shot later that afternoon. If you believe that there is no God and you're here all alone, then you'll be discouraged, you'll be angry, you'll be depressed, you'll be frustrated. If you believe there is a God, and not just believe in God, but if you believe he's sovereign, and that in the gospel he loves you, even though circumstances may not be to your choosing or liking, you'll live with faith, poise, trust, and joy. Actions have consequences. Beliefs have consequences. Well, we're going to start this series, We Believe... Therefore, which is about what we believe and some of the consequences that come from it, we're going to start today by looking at boundaries and the Bible. Now, we've got a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to try to do it in a way that at least, hopefully, will make sense. It does to me. It may not to you. I want to start with a couple of quotes just to get you started. Neither of these quotes are from the Bible. Here's the first quote. In the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. Now that quote's been attributed to lots of people through the ages. I've seen it attributed to Augustine. I've seen it attributed to John Wesley. I've seen it attributed to lots of people. I think I found the correct reference. I think that that quote comes from Rupert Meldenius. He's from one of the reformers from the 16th century, and I think it comes from him. Now, if that quote sounds familiar to you, it probably should, because that is where we get the idea of our three concentric circles from. Remember, we talk about absolutes, things that all Christians believe, right? Things that are clearly regular taught in the Bible. Convictions, those things that are not essential for salvation, but you have to have convictions, right? Non-essential, and then preferences. So our idea of absolutes, convictions, preferences actually goes back to this quote by Rupert Maldenius. I get a second quote from you, yeah, much more contemporary. This quote comes from a sign on the locker insurance building. I pass the locker office building every day coming to work, and I love their new sign. Here's what it says. Let us simplify the complexity. Um, I don't know about you, lots of preachers and teachers, I think they complexify the simple. Our goal is to simplify the complexity, and if you think the insurance world can be complex, you don't know anything about the theological world and the church world. So let me just show you a word picture, a word cloud of, um, of, of just a slice of Calvary Church. Calvary Church is a complex, complicated, disconnected mess in some regards, right? Now here's the point. In that word cloud are only a few things that we do, a few things we believe, a few programs that we run, a few strategies that we've employed, but how does this connect to that? How do Sunday morning services connect to our doctrinal statement? How does our doctrinal statement connect to our ministry convictions? How does ministry convictions uh, connect to Calvary Kids? How does Calvary Kids connect them? It's complicated, right? Well, this series, hopefully, will simplify the complexity. Hopefully, it won't complexify the simple, all right? 
So that, that's what we're going to do. So we got a couple of pictures, I think more in pictures than words. So we got a couple of pictures to get us started, and then we got a couple of things we have, to tack, uh, we have to tackle. Well, you saw in that word cloud our statement of faith. Well, what is our statement of faith? Well, our statement of faith would kind of be the foundation. Or if we had a pyramid, uh, it would be the lowest level. Now, the way we describe our statement of faith, it is not unique to us. In fact, if you ever read our doctrinal statement, our statement of faith, that same statement of faith could be adopted. It's very similar to lots of other churches like Calvary Church. That's why the foundation is really big, right? Our biblical theological foundation can be shared by lots and lots of different ministries. Well, we don't just have a doctrinal statement or a statement of faith. We have lots of programs and lots of methods. And the programs and methods are the things that we do. Now, you'll notice... The programs and methods are much smaller. That doesn't mean we don't do much. We do tons of stuff. It means that not every church and not every belief system can do what we do. We practice certain methods. We have certain programs. But not everybody can share those programs. It's a little more specific, a little more Calvaryized, right? Now, there are some churches very like us, but it's a smaller group than the big foundation, everybody that could share our statement of faith. Now, here's what often happens, though. Every church I know of, every ministry that I know of, whether it's parachurch or church, has a statement of faith, and they do lots of stuff, lots of methods and programs. But there's something in between. What, what's missing in between? Well, we would say that is our ministry convictions. Calvary's ministry convictions. What connects our statement of faith to the things that we do are ministry convictions. Now, ministry convictions smaller than our statement of faith. How we read the Bible. You've heard us talk about our four pillars of how we read the Bible. Our definition of ministry. The fact that we do three relationships discipleship, right? And it's kind of smaller. It's not quite as specific as programming But it's our ministry convictions. If you think of our circles, right? I think we have our circle diagram up here. There it is. Absolutes, they would be kind of the foundation where everybody shares. Convictions a little more specific than that or a little broader. You you may share the center with other believers, but you can have different theological convictions. And a church has to have certain ministry convictions. Things that we do in ministry that other churches may not. We share the absolute center, but then the program we do, the methodology, that would be on the outside. They would be our preferences, how we're actually implementing our convictions, which are based on our absolutes. So are we hopefully simplifying some of the complexity? Well, here's what we're going to do in this series. We're not going to look at the whole diagram. Here's what we're going to do. We're only going to look at a few things in the center. We're going to take a couple of things over these next few weeks that are in the center of the circle. We're going to look at a few of the absolutes. And if you notice, when you watch the video before the message, that video actually had for you the Apostles' Creed. Now, the Apostles' Creed would probably be the oldest and clearest statement of the absolute center. Right? What do you have to believe in order to be a Christian? What do you have to be to be a follower of Jesus? Certain things in that center, in that foundation. We're going to look at a couple of things in that center because at the end of the series, you're going to be hearing and learning about specific strategies, programs, new initiatives. But I want you to be reminded right up front, we're not leaving the center. The foundation is secure. There may be some nuance and change to what is going to happen methodologically, but you need to know theologically and biblically the center is sure, the foundation is not moving. Uh, Nothing weird, by the way, is coming, but uh, don't get scared by that. We're going to roll out in a few weeks what we're calling our priority-based action plan, and that priority-based action plan will actually be for the next three years. Um, We're not going to be specific about that until the first weekend in October. We want to lay the foundation, clarify the center, before we get to some of the change on the periphery or at the top of the pyramid. All right? Well, that's where we're headed. So here's what we're going to do. 
We're going to look at two things today. And the two things that we're going to look at, hopefully we'll clarify and simplify, we're going to look at boundaries and Bible. You think, well, why in the world are we starting with boundaries? Uh, let me explain it to you this way. Every organization, every company, every church, every organization, every organization has boundaries. Every organization has certain beliefs and certain practices. So we're not talking about the Bible yet. We're talking about all organizations. So let me give you a couple of examples before we get to the Bible. A couple. Um, Jim Gaffigan. Any of you know Jim Gaffigan, the comedian? Uh, we got three people. Good. Uh, well, you may not know Jim Gaffigan, but I, I think you'll appreciate this quote. Here, here's one of the things that Jim said. Um, oh, I want you all to know, I've become a vegetarian. But not a real strict vegetarian. I still eat steak and chicken. I could be a vegetarian, right? Um, well, why is that funny? Well, it's funny because it's absurd. You can't be a vegetarian and eat chicken and steak. You can call yourself a vegetarian, but you're not a vegetarian if you eat chicken and steak. That's how it works, right? But that's true of every organization. So, for example, Greenpeace, Cat Lovers, Soccer fans, the knitting club, the book club, every organization has boundaries. So let me give you another example. Suppose you do your banking at Harleysville Bank. You got your checking account at Harleysville Bank, got your mortgage at Harleysville Bank, got your savings account, all that stuff's at Harleysville Bank. Now, you can't go into Univest and place a withdrawal because you're not a member of the Univest family. You do your banking at Harleysville Bank. Now, hopefully, they'll be nice to eat Univest. They'll be happy to open an account. But you're not a member of the Univest network if all of your deposits and all of your savings and your checking account and mortgage are at Hardeesville Bank. Now, they're not being nasty. They're not being exclusive. That's just how it works, right? Um, suppose you're a member of Hardeesville Souter and Gun Club. If you're not a member of Hardeesville Souter and Gun Club, you can't go sight your rifle in before hunting season at Harleysville Saturday and Gun Club if you're not a member. Now, you can sneak on. Just don't go over five miles an hour when you pull in. They'll pull you over. Um, you can't go to the pistol range. You can't go to the rifle range. You can't attend the meetings unless you go through the lottery and you become a member of the Harleysville Saturday and Gun Club. So what I'm trying to say to you, sometimes Christianity is criticized is being like super exclusive and Christianity, only certain people. That's true of every organization. You can't take books out of the library unless you have a library card. Every organization has beliefs and practices. Now, there's actually technical terms for those things. And you need to know, these are not religious terms, but they become religious terms. So we're going to learn vocabulary today. The first of those terms is orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is not primarily a religious term. You know what orthodox, the word ortho, you probably know ortho from the medical world, right? The word ortho does not mean religious. The word ortho is just trans, transliterated from Greek. What's it mean? Straight, true. When you go to an orthodontist, what do they do? They straighten your dantes, your teeth. Right? Straight and true. Orthopedics, they teach you how to raise your kids straight and true. Right? So ortho just means straight and true. Doxy means belief. It means things that you believe. So an orthodox, every organization has a set of orthodox principles. The things you believe. If you're a member of Greenpeace, there are certain things you believe. Right? You, or for example, Jim Gaffigan, when he said, he's not an orthodox vegetarian. But here's what you need to know. Every organization not only has a set of things you have to believe, and a set of, they also have convictions. So think of, veg, I don't mean to pick on vegetarians, but it, it's easy to. Um, <laughs> you can be a vegetarian, but you can leave the absolute circle of vegetarianism and there are certain convictions. I mean, there are some really strict vegetarians out there, right? 
And there are even preferences. I don't eat this, I don't eat that. Well, yeah, every organization has orthodox beliefs. And then there are some convictions. You can tweak it a little bit. And then there are preferences on the outside. So Christians are not different in having orthodox beliefs. Every organization has orthodox beliefs. If you're a member of a golf club, well, there's orthodoxy there, right? You have to believe certain things. Oh, yeah, but it's not just orthodoxy. Here's also another funny word, orthopraxy. Now, you could probably figure this one out, right? Straight, true, what? Not beliefs, not docs, but what? Practices, practices. Every organization has straight and true beliefs, and if you don't believe those things, you can call yourself whatever you want to call yourself, but you're not really in the group, you're not a member, unless you believe certain things, and then you have to do certain things. You have to pay your bill if you belong to something. You have to keep up to date with your dues. You have, to attend, you have to go to the gun club, fill out the pay. If you're going to become a client of a particular law firm, you have to fill out the application and you have to pay a retainer. Every organization has orthodoxy and orthopraxy. The church is not unique in that. The church is just like every other organization. Um, so how exclusive are we? Well, I, I would say it like this. If the church is exclusive, we're the most inclusive, exclusive group ever. Anybody can join. All you have to do is to admit the truth about yourself. You're a rebel running from God. Turn from that, repent and turn to Jesus. Trust him for forgiveness and acceptance with God. Anybody can join, but you can't be a member without orthodox beliefs and certain orthopractices, right? They've gotta be straight and true. Christianity has boundaries, beliefs and practices. Not everybody's in. It's very, anybody can come, but everybody that comes has to have certain orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Uh, let me give you a, a quick example. In maybe one of the most famous statements in the Bible about what, what it is to be a Christian and what it is to um, follow Jesus is found in Jesus' last words to his disciples in Matthew's Gospel. So in Matthew 28, we have the Great Commission. Um, let me read to you the Great Commission. Now think in your minds, Christianity has certain boundaries, right? certain beliefs and certain practices. And right in this statement that Jesus gives, notice there are beliefs and there are practices both. So here's what he says. Jesus came to them and said, all authority, nothing left out, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Now he describes what disciples are to believe and what they're to do. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the end of age. Notice, and, and we're not going to work our way in detail through these verses, I just want you to see, from the very beginning... To be a Christian means you have to believe certain things. What does it say? You've got to believe that Jesus has authority to do this, and you have to believe the teaching that he gave. And the teaching is not only what he tells us to do. The teaching is who he is and what he came to accomplish. If you don't believe who Jesus is and you don't believe what he came to accomplish, you can call yourself anything you want, but you're not a disciple. You're not a follower of Jesus unless you believe who Jesus is and what he came to do. But notice, it's not just beliefs. Teaching them to obey. Maybe a better translation, I think, would be observe. That's the word. Teaching them to observe. The way you observe Christmas. The way you observe. I don't know what you, you and your family do. I, don't, I know some of what we do as a church and what we do as a family. right? Teaching them doctrine, right? the orthodoxy side, to observe the orthopraxy side. And who are those that follow that orthodoxy and orthopraxy? Disciples of Jesus. 
And so right from the very beginning, Christians are followers of Jesus. Christians are not people who just check a box of what they, they think is right. Christians are followers of Jesus. Maybe the best translation um, is that we are apprentices. That, that would be our contemporary translation of disciple. A disciple is not just a student who sits in class and can pass a test. A disciple is an apprentice. What do apprentices do? They have to learn certain things, teaching, and they have to be able to do certain things. They've got to practice those things. So Christianity from the very beginning has not just been a head knowledge thing. It's orthodox and orthoprax, both of those together. Right, got it? Well, that brings us then to a question. How then do we know what Jesus taught? How do we know who Jesus is? How do we know what Jesus came to do? And how do we know what those practices are that followers of Jesus need to be living out? Well, I'm glad you asked, because that brings us to my second point. And that's the Bible. Now, we could spend a lot of time on this, and uh, I kept thinking, uh, I, I don't want to make this like a classroom, but uh, it may wind up being that way. It, it's going to be quick. Um, but put your student hat on or get your butt comfortable in a seat for a couple minutes, because um, there are some things we need to know about the Bible. Now, here's my guess. Most of you already know this, and you already believe it. And you need to be reminded of it. Because we live in a culture and a world where the majority of people do not believe it. And so we need to know why we believe it, and we need to know what difference it makes. Remember the series is, we believe, therefore. So what do you believe about the Bible, and what difference does it make? So here's what we're going to, There are a couple things you need to know. Here's the first one. I'll tell you up front, right, because I don't want you falling asleep. We believe that the Bible, the New Testament, was written by eyewitnesses, written by people who saw, touched, and heard what they write about. So they're not making it up. It wasn't 500 years later. It wasn't, so, oh, here's what I thought. You know, I had bad pizza. Here's what I, no, 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 eyewitnesses. Now, we don't have time to run down a number of verses. We could easily do that. Let me just read one from the beginning of John's uh, letter, 1 John. John, the disciple John, one of Jesus' followers, was an eyewitness, and he writes the letter, and here's what he says. That which was from the beginning, now think eyewitness, which we have heard, eyewitness, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. He was there. He heard him. He touched them. He saw them. This we proclaim, the word of, we, we proclaim concerning the word of life. All right, next one. The life appeared... Jesus appeared, and we've seen it, testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to the Son. He's appeared to us, and we were witnesses of it. See how that works? What, we proclaim this to you. We proclaim what we've seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. First thing, Bible, New Testament recorded by eyewitness. And some of you who may know the Scripture say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mark was not an eyewitness. Luke was not an eyewitness, and you're correct. But Mark and Luke both heard from eyewitnesses, and they recorded what the eyewitnesses told them. Read the beginning of Luke's gospel. He tells you as much, right? Hey, I collected all this testimony. I talked to the eyewitnesses, and I'm proclaiming to you, I'm declaring to you what I learned from the eyewitnesses. Mark was Peter's compadre. Mark traveled around with Peter. Peter was an eyewitness. So the New Testament was written by eyewitnesses or those who had access and heard from eyewitnesses. But eyewitnesses can forget. Eyewitnesses can get it wrong. I mean, have it in a courtroom where two eyewitnesses disagree. What are you going to do with that? Oh, yeah, we got a verse for that, too. In John 14, verse 26, here's what we read. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, look at this, he will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. See, we got two deals here, right? We got, account, we got the accounts of eyewitnesses and we've got the preserving, 
message of the Spirit who is preserving exactly what happened. So it's not just eyewitness and their testimony. We got eyewitnesses energized and causing their mind to know what's there from the Holy Spirit. So we got the Holy Spirit and we got eyewitnesses. Therefore, what we read in the New Testament can be trusted. It is absolutely true. So you need to know that, right? Um, well, now, now we need a couple other verses, right? There are two big ideas that you need to know about if you're thinking about the Bible. Those ideas are inspiration and authority. And we got two verses for these. Sorry, you may want to jot them down. Check this out or we'll send you to slide deck. All right, the scripture is inspired by God. That language comes from 2 Timothy 3. So here's what Paul writes to Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed. That's the word inspired, right? And now, not inspired the way you say, oh my goodness, that, that song was just inspired. No, no, no. It's God breathed, right? When you breathe, stuff comes out of your mouth. And what um, Paul's writing to Timothy is, the scripture finds its source in God. God breathed it. Now, he used human authors right, to write it, and they wrote with their vocabulary based on their experience, but God was superintending so that what they wrote is exactly what God wanted written. All scripture is God-breathed. Well, so what? What's it good for? Oh, here it is. Teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for most good work. No, no, every good work. So the only thing that you may not need the scripture for is for all the bad works, right? (laughs) No, the spirit is the source of the scripture. Now, here's the other verse you need to know, right? And this same idea, right? Same idea, God inspires, right? So we got eyewitnesses moved by the Holy Spirit, God's source, and here's the other one from 2 Timothy 1. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, And you do well to pay attention to it, as it is a light uh, to all who believe. We also, we go back? Oh, we have the prophetic message, which is completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. All right, next, there. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. Let me read uh, verse 21. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though they were human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. There we are again, right? Prophets, eyewitnesses, they saw, heard, got received... And they were carried along by the Spirit. I I love the picture of that. That carried along language is actually the same imagery used of a sailboat. You know what? You can sit in a sailboat. You can hoist the sail and you can work on the rudder and do the steering thing. If there's no wind blowing, you're not going anywhere. You had the prophets, the apostles. They sat down. And what carried them along? The breath of the Spirit. So they wrote in their vocabulary. When you read John, you know you're not reading Peter. When you read Isaiah, you know you're not reading Ezekiel, right? Um, They're using their vocabulary, their experience, but God is blowing them along. God is moving them so that the product is exactly what God wanted written. That's what we believe. Inspiration. It finds its source in God. Well, if that's true then, based on those two verses we looked at, If it's God's word, recorded by eyewitnesses, protected and preserved and uh, moved moved along by the Holy Spirit, I kind of think that would mean the Bible's our authority for life and practice, don't you think? Where do we learn what Jesus did, who he is, and what he calls us to do? Well, you go to the Bible, you know, every, every once in a while, I'll hear someone say, or I more often will read it, Um, Someone will say, well, you know what? I just follow Jesus. I'm not really into and I don't really like the Bible. I'm a vegetarian. I just eat chicken and steak. (laughs) How do you know who Jesus is? The Bible is the only window we have through which to see Jesus. If you don't have a scripture 
What Jesus are you following? How do you know who he is? How do you know what he did? It's in the pages of Scripture. It's in that written account that we learn who Jesus is. And therefore, we follow the one that we see there. Now, I, I want to say, not everybody is going to believe the exact same way about how that inspiration took place. Not everybody's going to believe it happened like this, but every believer through the centuries, every Christian, all Christians across denominational lines, followers of Jesus, they believe the Bible is inspired by God and it's authoritative for life and practice. Every belie- that's in the absolute circle, friends. Um, now, that's not a statement about Jesus yet. That's not a statement about God. We'll talk about those things in the next couple of weeks. But we need to start by saying every organization has boundaries. Not just, not just the church, not just Christians. Every organization has boundaries. The Bible has some. There are orthodox belief and certain practices that are true to following Jesus. A Christian doesn't mean you check the boxes and you only give mental assent. A Christian means you believe, therefore you live. So let me ask you, um, if the Bible really is God's word, think about it. The same God that spoke and everything that exists came into being. The same God who saw our plight in being in our sin without access to him. And he tapped Jesus on the shoulder and said, hey, son, I've got a mission for you. And Jesus jumped at the chance to take our place. And he came and we have all those holidays. At Christmas, we remember the incarnation. On Good Friday, we remember the crucifixion. And on Easter Sunday, we remember he rose from the dead alive. God pronounced, it's satisfied. The debt is fully paid. If the same God did all of that and communicated this to us, what should we be doing? I'll tell you what you shouldn't be doing. You shouldn't be putting it on the table or on a bookshelf and never cracking its pages. And I'm not talking about it. You can do it on your phone, your iPad, whatever. If it really is God's word, we should kind of figure out what he says, don't you think? And if he really did all that for us, we should find our primary assurance and put our faith in what's there. And Jesus, the one who's the primary object of all the text. Well, what does that have to do with Calvary Church? What's the therefore? Um, Well, let me go back to the cloud, our word cloud, with a little change. So I I didn't even give the comm team a heads up. So this is what the comm team did. Here's what I said. I said, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back through the word cloud. And I want you to highlight the things in 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 the word cloud that you believe emphasize, prioritize the communication of Scripture. Now, we do lots of things. But what are the things that primarily communicate and emphasize the Scripture? Well, we have a whole lot of shading, don't we? And I would say this, if we begin to start a whole lot of things that don't have the Bible in the center, it had better be connected to the Bible soon or through some other means or we need to stop doing that. Because the scripture is inspired by God. And it's our authority, our authority for church, our authority for life. Most of what we do is communicate the Bible. That's why we take more than half of every Sunday service to talk about the Bible. That's why students talk about the Bible. That's why in Bridge they learn about the Bible. That's why Calvary Kids about the Bible. That's why we have men and women's Bible study. It's about the Bible. If the Bible's God's word and we treat it as such, then what we do is going to be centered around the Bible. We start Wednesday nights this week. And uh, in case you didn't know, Wednesday nights are about the Bible. So we have a new members class, and I've said to you before, you don't, you don't have to be thinking, hey, I'm going to become a member you know, by Christmas. If you want to learn about Calvary Church and learn about some of our absolutes and some of the convictions that we have and some of the reasons that we've chose certain preferences, come to learn about us and Calvary's new member class. We also got a parenting class. What are you going to do in the parenting class? They're going to say, parents, you have certain responsibilities given by God in the Bible. 
Here are some helpful ways to live out those principles in your family, in your life. And if you, learn, if you want to learn about the next step of, this, of the Bible story, we have an Exodus study. We already did beginnings. We looked at Genesis 1 to 11. We did patriarchs, Genesis 12 through 50. Now we're picking up in Genesis. We're going to go through the rest of the Pentateuch. What are we? We're learning the next installment of the story. Calvary Church is about the Bible because the Bible is God-breathed. He gave it to us because he loves us to explain who Jesus is, to explain his mission of salvation and redemption, and to call us to become disciples, apprentices, as we follow him. We're not apprentices blindly trying to feel our way. We've got an owner's manual. It may not answer every question you have. It answers every question you need to know the answer to today and forever. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks uh, for the scripture. Forgive us for often uh, leaving it lie on a shelf, collecting dust, never opening that app in our phone, never going there in our, in our iPad or on the computer. And Lord, we're left to our own devices as skewed as that advice is and as warped as our perspective is. Lord, help us to realign our thoughts with you. Help us, Lord, to uh, understand what orthodox Christianity is and help us to live out the practices that Jesus came, lived, not just to give us an example. He lived them as our substitute and paid the debt that we owe. We pray in his name as presented in the Bible. Amen.